welcome to Focusing on God's Word with Pastor Everton Jeffers. Focusing on God's Word illuminates the Word of God by explaining the Scriptures and conducting word studies using Scripture to support Scripture in the revelation of His Word. Matthew eleven fifteen said, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. As he ministered to us today, here now is Pastor Everton Jeffers. A pleasant good day once again. Thank you so much for joining me on the Focusing on God's Word. I enjoy sharing God's Word. It's the best thing that any human being could do with their life. Everything else that we do, you name it, we're going to leave it right here. The only thing that we do that matters is what we do for Christ. That's the only thing that is going to last. And so I am going to do this until the master calls me home. Today I want to speak to you on the subject, instructions for righteous living. Instructions for righteous living. Have you ever wondered why the church is experiencing so many different issues? Have you ever wondered with the word of God, which is true, which cannot be a lie, with all of that available to the church, why is it that our church are experiencing so many different issues? Why is it that our young people nowadays don't seem to want Christ anymore? Our young women don't know how to treat their husbands. Our young men don't know how to treat their wives. Our young men don't know how to behave. And also, our young women don't know how to behave either. And you, you ask yourself, with all that is available in the Bible, how to live, how to speak, how to sleep, how to eat, what to wear, have you ever wondered, why is it that the church is still experiencing so much issues? Now, the question is, why are these issues existing? What I notice is that every member of the church is leaving the training of the church to the pastor. When the Bible clearly states that the training of the church should be done by its membership. One portion should be done at home because we spend most of our time at home and another aspect should be done by the church, those in leadership and even those who are just working, just holding a mere position because the training of the church partially belongs to the church. But I'm gonna show you why we're experiencing some of the issues that we're experiencing in the church, why the young people are not so much following the church dictates, and we are seeing our men going one way, our women going the other way, and we're asking the question, what is going on? In Ephesians, and I'm sorry, in Colossians, sorry, I love Ephesians, chapter one, we see exactly where the instructions for righteous living should come from. And I'm going to read them to you. There's so much for us to learn from this particular chapter. And this I might do in several parts. The Bible says, but as for you, referring to the Christian brethren, teach the things, those of us who teach and preach the word of God, Preach the things and teach the things which are in agreement with sound doctrine. Now, the question is, what is sound doctrine? Because some people, 
get up in the pulpit and make a whole lot of noise. That is different and distinct from what is considered to be sound doctrine. So, Pastor, you tell us what is sound doctrine. Sound doctrine produces men and women of good character whose lifestyle identify them as true Christians or followers of Christ. So when you hear to teach sound doctrine, it must be that which produces men and women of good character and those whose lifestyle identifies with that of Christ. Sound doctrine has to do with right living, not just right thinking. It is the living is what we teach. And so it is not about what we say only, but it is about the way we live. Because a lot of people don't understand that our lives, without opening our mouth, also preaches to those we come in contact with. And so it's absolutely important that we recognize that sound doctrine, sound teaching, is done twofold. How we live, what we teach. So please don't forget this. Now, I want us to look at four qualities of matured manhood. And verse 2 actually teaches us something that we need to grab a hold of. It says that the older men, and the word older there literally refers to an older man. In those days, the, 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 the Bible were, were, was passed down by the older generation imparting it to the younger ones. And so in this sense, it is referring to an old man or that man who would have experienced and learned about God, passing it on to those who are coming. And it is important for those of us who are truly born again to make sure that we impart the things of God to those that God has placed to work with us or if you want to say beneath us. It says the older men are to be sober to voluntarily place limitation on one's own wisdom and to, it speaks also to a man's mental judgment. So it is saying that the older men must be sober. And sober dear means that we place limitation on our own freedom. And let me explain what that means because it is important to understand when I say place limitation on our own freedom. Now there are a lot of things that we can do that is not wrong, biblically speaking, but in doing it can cause someone to stumble. Let me give you an instant. Nothing is wrong in drinking wine. But then, if that wine, in the process of drinking it, is going to cause another brother to stumble or become drunk, it is better we abstain from drinking that wine before that brother so that he does not stumble. And so when he talks about placing limitation on one's freedom, it's talking about what you are at liberty to do, which the Bible does not condemn, that might affect another brother or sister's way of thinking and cause them to fall or to stumble in the process. It also speaks to a man's mental judgment, making decisions. You have to make decisions not only based on your own interests, but make your decisions to include all. The church is one body, but it is made up of many members. None of us should do things just for our own benefit, 
but it should be done for the benefit of all. And so that is why the Bible says that the older men be sober. That is what that means. And then it says they must be temperate, meaning having self-control. That older man must have self-control. He must be able to control his temper, control his flesh, by allowing the Spirit of God to control him. If you are not in a position to do so, then you do not fall into this category. It says he must be modest as to opinion. You know, there are some people that whatever they say goes, and regardless of what you're trying to show them, what they say stand, the Bible is saying that the older man, he must be sober, and I explain what that is, he must be temperate, and I explain what that is, he must be modest as to opinion, dignified, and he must also be sensible. And I just mentioned how important that is. He must be sensible, because when you look at it, if he does not operate as a sensible person, then he can say to himself, listen, I can take a glass of wine, it doesn't affect me. So what do I care about the others who, if they take a glass of wine, they, they, they're drunk? You cannot, we cannot operate that way as a child of God. There are certain things does not affect some of you, but it affects those who are around you before you know that it's going to affect them in a negative way, I would advise you, as an older person, don't do it. The other thing that we need to understand is that the church must not be filled with silly old men. Those older men must be men who are seriously sensible, modest, and have self-control. They must not be aggressive, and, and, and this is important. They must be older men, Christian men, and they must be kind men also, who are worthy of respect. These men, and I'm going to tell you why in a few minutes, why this is important that these older men be in this particular frame or have these particular, uh, particular characteristics. They must not be aggressive, and I, I've said that earlier. When asked about things, especially pertaining to the Bible, you should not be aggressive. If you're a teacher, as these older men ought to be, then they must be temperate. The questions that are asked must be dealt with in such a way that the listener learn from you, the older man, so that they can sincerely do so when they're passing it on to those who would ask after them. They should teach, but they should do so in love. These older men are to teach, and in their teaching, it must be done in love, thereby making themselves men who the younger men would want to go to for further advice. And let me explain this. You go to some pastors today, and sometimes it leaves much to, to be desired. They answer you as if, how dare you ask me a question? Pastors, Bible teachers, it is their duty to ask us questions. As older men and as more matured men, it is our duty to respond to them appropriately and more than anything else, to deal with them in love. Remember, we are mentors, we are coaches, 
we have to deal with these people in a manner that they will feel comfortable in the future to come back to us to seek advice. That is why many of our young men are going elsewhere to get information. That is why they're not turning to those of us who should, they should be turning to for advice. Because what we're doing in our answers, we're literally turning them away. We are aggressive. We answered out, out, of, out of lack of love. And sometimes with this day as if, how dare you ask me that question? Jesus handled his situation based on love. It also went on to say that, that you must be sound in faith. And I want to make this clear. Because I'm laying the foundation for what I'm going to be going into maybe in the next two, three weeks. It says that they must be sound in faith. And there are three qualities which are present in the man who is spiritually healthy. That older man, our old man, three qualities that you can find in him to show you that as old as he is, he is spiritually healthy. And let, let's look at them. One, his faith. His faith in God means so much. Number two, his love. Listen, the Bible clearly said in John, I believe 13, 25, it says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love. Not how well you can preach, not how well you dress, but if you have love one for another. And the other thing that is good and another quality that is good for the older man is that he's steadfast. He's not wishy-washy. He's not move about with every wind of doctrine, but he's steadfast. He knows what the Bible said, say, and he stick to it, not wavering. Those three qualities, when you find them in a good man or good woman, those are people that you would want to run to. He must be patient. Patience is the persistence which bravely bear the trials and affliction of life without losing heart or giving up. So when somebody says that, listen, that man is very patient, or I am patient, what that person is saying is that I bravely bear the trials and affliction of life without losing heart or giving up, without turning away from God and the gospel when difficult time comes. It says, in love and in steadfastness, this speaks to Christ-like in character. Sound doctrine, watch this, wherever there is sound doctrine, it produces sound living. Where there is sound doctrine, it produces sound living. Healthy doctrine produces healthy living. And it says that the older men in the congregation are to be example of charity and are not to be grumpy just because something or someone is different. Even you have to reprove or rebuke someone, that must be done in love. Let's look at verse 3. This is important for the church. In this study, we're going to see why our young people are going in the direction they're going. And we're going to see that we, especially the older folks, are partially responsible for the way or the direction that some of the church is going at this time. In verse 3, it says that the older women... Similarly, are to be reverent in their behavior. Now, the older women here, and in that time, is referring to those 40 and above who would have been married and have children 
and so gain experience that they can pass on. This is speaking of the way the older women, and, and, and I want to make this clear. It says that they must be reverent in their behavior. And so the, what is this referring to? This is speaking of the way the older women dress and how they carry themselves. So when it talks about reverence in behavior, it has a lot to do with the dressing and the way they carry themselves. The way they speak also covers in this reverence in terms of their behavior. In 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9, it says also, I desire that women should adorn themselves modestly and appropriately and sensibly in seemly apparel, not with elaborate hair arrangement or gold or pearl or expensive clothing. Now, please don't go and tell anybody that Pastor Jeffrey say that the women should not dress well. You should dress well. Please don't go and tell anybody that Pastor Jeffrey say you're not supposed to take care of your hair, your face, and what have you. The key word I want you to remember pertaining to what I have just said is elaborate hair arrangement or gold or pearl or expensive clothing. It is, it is going overboard. Now, when I say that, I also want to make this pellucid. That women also are to be appropriately dressed, especially when they come into the house of God. You should not be too short or too exposed. Because that does not speak to reverent behavior. And yes, you can say whatever you want to say about me. But it is Bible that I'm telling you about. And it says that you must dress appropriately. It must not be elaborate. It, you must not be going overboard. And this is actually speaking to that which is excessive. I don't want you to be too long also that your dress is sweeping the floor. And too long that nobody can see your hand. But just make sure that when you're coming, you're dressed properly, you're properly covered. Because guess what? In your dressing, without you speaking, you are training those young ladies that are coming up behind of you. You're going to see the purpose of this uh, Colossians chapter 1. Let's continue in verse 10 of 1 Timothy chapter 2. But by doing good deeds, listen to this, reverent behavior, by doing good deeds, deeds in themselves good, and for the good and advantage of those contacted by them, as befit women who profess reverential fear for and devotion to God. It is so important that our women, our ladies, let's put it this way, recognize that they are the example or should be the example for the world. When they dress, the pattern of dress, the way they look, the way they talk, the way they move should be a pattern for the world to look at. Paul says that we are living epistle read by all men. Not just when we speak, but what we do also ties into what we say. And so please remember that. In Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 20, that reverent woman, that woman who uh, reverends herself in behavior, Proverbs 31, 20 speaks to her. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. She has children that are not her biological children. You see, we need to understand how important this is. We need to understand how important this is. Because listen, even though a woman don't have any biological children, she can become a mother. 
to those she comes in contact with simply because of the way she carry herself or her general character. When I look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9 in the NLT, uh, uh, this is what it says. And I want women to be modest in their appearance, that they should wear decent and appropriate clothing and not draw attention to themselves by the way they fix their hair or by wearing gold or pearl or expensive clothes. For women who claim to be devoted to God should make themselves attracted by the good things they do. I like the NLT. This, this, this Amplified made it uh, pretty clear as to what should happen. We're talking about what are instructions for righteous living. And this is saying that once our women, our ladies begin to dress appropriately, that uh, we will see positives coming out. It says that our women must not be malicious gossips, teaching what is right and good. Now, let's look at what is gossip because sometimes we categorize everything as gossip. When the Bible says that there must not be malicious gossip, but teaching what is good, the sin of gossip is bearing bad news behind someone's back out of a bad heart. These things, and the Bible is saying this to the women, but you have men also who gossip. So please, men don't think you are excluded. It is saying the sin of gossip is bearing bad news behind someone's back out of a bad heart. What made gossip Gossip is the reason behind why you did it. Gossip has to do with what motivates you for saying what you are saying about the person. It is a story of someone else's sin or an accusation with the intention to bring harm to that person or shame. So when the Bible says that women, you are not to do this, I'm going to include men, you also are not to do this, remembering that you are training those who you come in contact with. Hearsay, a rumor, a half-truth. Always remember this. Gossip hurts neighbors, divide friends, damage reputations, and also relationships. So the Bible is saying, listen, instruction for righteous living means that these things you need to avoid. You will only hurt those who are closest to you. It went on, and again, covering the women, it says, the women should not be addicted to much wine. Now, if you notice, it did not say they must not be or they must not drink wine. It is saying that they must not be addicted to too much wine. So it's not the condemnation of drinking wine. It is the condemnation of excess, too much wine. I want to say this, and this is basically part one. When we get into part two, you're going to see exactly what happened here. Some women sit down and drink with their children. Now, it is not all who drink wine becomes addict. But I want to make this clear. But addiction starts with your first drink. So make up in your mind what you're going to do. Addiction starts when that person takes his or her first drink. I also, as I wrap up part one, want to say this. The older women cannot teach what they do not possess. Neither can the older man teach what he does not possess. Instruction for righteous living 
you must be instructed first, you must be knowledgeable first before you can teach. Because remember, in part two, we're going to see who we are teaching. And we're going to see why the church today is having so many issues. Because the persons who are supposed to be teaching are not teaching. And are leaving everything up to pastor to do when all of us come from a home. And they spend more time at home. But let's continue to see what the word of God have to say. Now we need to seriously notice that there are major differences between what the men and women ought to do. It is one thing when a woman gossip, but when a man gossip, it is really bad. A man should try his endeavor best to keep away from that. Also a woman, but when a man does it, it makes it even worse. Verse 4. Listen to why Paul wrote to the church at Colossae telling them what the older men should do and what the women also should do. Verse 4 says, so that they may encourage this part, these specifically with the women and the younger women. Paul said in 3, this is what the older women should do. And it says the purpose for doing so is so that they may encourage the younger women to be tenderly love their husband and their children. Now, I looked at this and I said, why the Bible didn't say to tenderly love their children and their husband? Because you need to understand that the Bible sets the principle. And yes, out there in the world, you might not want to love your husband over your children. But biblically speaking, the Bible says that you are to love your husband and your children. Without your husband, there will be no children. So you love your husband and out of love, you and your husband produce children. So you must love your husband first, then love your children. He was there before your children. It is out of love that you came together and produced children. And so you must love your husband. And also, the term love your husband. Notice the Bible says, teach the younger women to tenderly love their husband. What does that mean? That means that you turn them into husband lovers. Now, how do you teach a young lady to turn her husband or turn her into a husband lover? Let's look at Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 26. And I'm going to expand on it and then close. In verse 26 of Proverbs 31, this is what it says. She opened her mouth in skillful and godly wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue, giving counsel and instruction. Notice, the wife's first priority, as we look at verse 4, is to her husband, to love and to cherish him. This Proverbs 31 woman demonstrates what it is to love her husband. And it shows how she turns a young lady into what is called husband lovers. Yes, when you meet, sometimes there's affection for one another. But when you follow the pattern of the older women, you become a husband lover. Now, when it talks about to love her children, that means to use and keep proper discipline and government over them. It is very important. Not only their temporal, but spiritual and eternal welfare. To bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So what this is telling us, as I close today, 
that the older women have a responsibility to teach the younger women how to be home efficient. Let me use it that way. They must know what it is to be able to prepare, prepare a meal. They must be able to know what it is to have a husband. They must be in a position to know what it is when they have children to raise those children. They must understand that the child has two part, his physical life and his spiritual life. She, that older woman, is responsible to teach that younger woman how to bring up those children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So it is not always the pastor's duty alone to teach that, but the older women have a responsibility to the younger women to teach them how to dress. Now, if you're at home and you and your husband are at home, your dressing to attract your husband and to entice your husband is totally in order. But when you leave your house, or your home, it's completely different. What your husband sees is not for the public. Please remember that. And so these older women are to teach how, they, how the younger women are to dress, to speak, to behave at home, to deal with their husband, and to deal with their children. Next time we come back, we will deal with part two and the five areas that the older women ought to gear these younger women when they are growing up in the church. May God bless you today. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Focusing on God's Word with Pastor Everton Jeffers, a Bible-based study revealing the Word of God. You can follow Pastor Jeffers on God's First Radio at 102.9 FM from 1 p.m. each Sunday or on Abundant Life Radio at 103.9 FM. You can also follow him on Facebook or the YouTube channel. Thank you once again for listening to Focusing on God's Word. May God continue to bless you.